Hi, welcome to the Trauma and Resilience Podcast. I'm Ricky Robertson. Today, our guest is Sarah Robottom, the Senior Technical Advisor for Education and Youth Programs with the International Rescue Committee. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Ricky. Thanks so much for having me. Wonderful. So to start off, we're going to talk today about ways to support students who are refugees or have experienced forced migration. Sarah, would you tell us a little bit about the work that you do with the International Rescue Committee? Sure. Um, So the International Rescue Committee is an organization that works across the arc of crisis in a broad range of sectors from safety and health, economic well-being and power, and of course, education. Uh, Our mission is to help people whose lives and livelihoods have been shattered by conflict and disaster to survive, recover, and regain control over their future. So if I were a teacher, your organization could actually help me understand how to better support my students who've experienced forced migration and kind of have an understanding of what they and their families may be going through and how I can, you know, show up as an educator to to hopefully better support their learning and their overall well-being. Absolutely. We do some uh, educator professional development uh, in different offices, you know, engaging with our school district partners or individual schools or sometimes with state departments of education uh, to offer professional development to educators. Uh, We also produce some guidance materials um, that talk about, you know, how to understand uh, the experience of forced migration and how to, um, you know, strategies that educators can use in their work, you know, to support students affected by forced migration. And we have a couple of online e-modules that that also educators can access to do some of that learning on their own or in partnership with their peers. I love that. And are the e-modules, I'm just going to ask, are they free? (laughs) Yes, they're free. Uh, They're on the uh, Kaya Humanitarian uh, Academy platform, which is a free platform that a lot of humanitarian agencies use to kind of house learning in one place, but anyone can create an account and access uh, trainings that are on there. Okay, we will absolutely put a link then to those in the show notes so that folks can access them because that would be an incredible resource. And I love free things. And I know a lot of educators (laughs) love free things. And so to be able to access some modules around trauma informed care and practices to better support students Uh, especially those who've experienced forced migration. I'm having one of those moments as I hear you speak where I'm thinking about when I started teaching. I started as a New York City public school teacher. And at the time, I worked in one of the most diverse school districts in New York City. And I worked in a school where about at that time, about 80% of our students were immigrants or refugees. And a lot of my students had experienced forced migration. I had students from Tibet. I had students who who emigrated from Haiti after the the earthquake a little more than a decade ago. And I had so many students who had experienced forced migration for a variety of reasons, whether it was political conflicts or natural disasters. And there was no, I didn't receive any training on how to support these students. I just went in and tried to teach math, right? Having no idea what these students might have gone through or be going through. And so I guess I'm just curious when you're talking with teachers, what are some of the simple ways that folks could could better support students who are experiencing this? Our work in, at IRC you know, is very much rooted in trauma-informed care principles, which I know you're, you're an expert in. Um, and we, we use a model we call healing classrooms or healing learning spaces. Um, and it focuses on promoting five things that students who have experienced forced migration often need restored in order, you know, to create the conditions for learning. Mm. Um, And those five things I think are really helpful for educators to keep in mind, you know, when they're, when they're thinking about their work with these students. And so those are sense of control. So, you know, our students need to regain the ability to feel a sense of agency with what's going to happen to them throughout the day, feel like they can influence it, um, a sense of belonging. So feeling seen, understood and valued and cared for in that community, um, a sense of self-worth. So feeling competent and, and worthy um, to have positive relationships. So having safe and stable connections with educators, other staff and other students. And then intellectual stimulation. And by that, I mean, 
you know, understanding and seeing the value of the learning goals, you know, feeling appropriately challenged, feeling that they're making progress and being able to draw on their funds of knowledge to experience success. So think about what you're already doing with students that support sense of control, that supports sense of belonging, that supports positive relationships. Um, and then think about what are ways that maybe you could enhance that uh, and do that better. Because as you said, the school district you worked, worked in was incredibly diverse. Um, that means that the students' experiences are cre incredibly diverse, their educational histories and backgrounds and, and linguistics. So as educators in that in that kind of context, it's going to be impossible to know like everything about your student. I mean, yes, like do the research, do the work to develop an understanding of the backgrounds of your students. Um, but, you know, on the whole, keeping these kind of foundational principles in mind, I think is really helpful. And, and sense of control is really huge. Um, mm. You know, that one, if we're going to pick one to start with, you know, that's really square one. Um, and we focus a lot on predictability and consistency. And I'm sure that educators listening have routines, you know, have um, done things to create an environment that is predictable and consistent. But thinking about that from the lens of students that are brand new to the culture and are often learning the language um, and not only the language of like the academics and the content, but learning the language of the school culture, of the school expectations. And think of it from that angle and like, what can you do to increase students' sense of control, you know, from that perspective? Can you translate documents like schedules or agendas or add visual aids? You know, can you improve the extent to which those students can meet their basic needs in the classroom? Um, or make transitions feel more organized or that it's clear what the expectations around them. Like just thinking about your environment and the routines you go through every day um, to create more predictability and consistency can be a really powerful step. I think that's, I, that's excellent advice because when you mentioned like students might be learning the language, I can think of students, many, many students I had who came into my classroom and didn't speak a word of English. I didn't speak a word of their native language. And, and so there was just basic communication, right? It was, was a challenge in and of itself for both of us, understanding one another, having them feel that sense of connection and belonging when folks are, are learning how to communicate. And so I think that, you know, that idea of emphasizing structure and routines and opportunities for the student to have a sense of control and agency is so meaningful. There were times when I would sometimes, if a, if a new student, for example, were joining the classroom and there was another student in the classroom who spoke that student's first language as well as spoke English, there were sometimes I would like sit them next to each other in an attempt to kind of hopefully create both a sense of connection, but also even just help them understand linguistically some of what was going on in my classroom. Do you think that was a good practice or you know, looking back, should I have handled it differently? I mean, every situation is unique, but I think yeah. that, you know, buddying students up with other students who can support them, definitely allowing that translanguaging in your classroom is going to support, uh, you know, students to, to acclimate. Um, I think, you know, where we caution against maybe engaging other students in the support you know, of, of newcomers is, is utilizing them as interpreters, you know, yeah. on a regular basis, like that's tricky. You don't know what dynamics are necessarily at play, especially if we're talking about like siblings or something, you know, maybe one sibling speaks better English than the other one. I, you know, I kind of caution against um, asking students to translate. Um, we should really try to leverage interpreters um, or, you know, other bilingual staff where that's possible for that, but definitely having um, peers as well as staff members that students have identified or you can help them to identify that can be like go-to people for them, whether that's like to help them understand the instructions that the teacher is giving or to just understand that things that are happening in the environment, like who can they ask those questions to? Because like orienting to the school environment is not one and done, right? This is a long yeah. process, a lot. There's going to be a lot to understand over time. Um, and so, you know, 
for students to have go-to people that they're able to develop that relationship of trust that they feel safe to ask all kinds of questions to is definitely a good strategy. What I'm taking away as an educator is really realizing this might be a journey of progress, not perfection. Like I'm going to have to probably make mistakes, but, and, and have to make time to reflect on my own practice and reflect on what's working and what's not working to meet the needs of a student. Does the work you do with IRC also help educators to understand kind of how to respond in those moments when we're seeing symptoms of trauma show up in the classroom? Yes, I think our we definitely emphasize though, those tier one supports for like how do we uh, first you know create the conditions to try to keep students in the classroom, um, and and one really important piece of this to you know not skip over is engaging with the family, um, mm. and when and often if we are seeing students that are s you know who who may escalate or. Um, have even bef hopefully before we get there, you know, are just maybe not fully engaging with the learning, they're paying attention to other things, or, you know, to really uh, reach out to the family and, and try to understand, um, you know, what are the students' strengths? How, you know, what do they see positive at home? Are there any challenges that the students have? You know, what, what are their priorities for them in school? Not necessarily to only focus on like what could be the risk factors for this student, but really get a holistic understanding um, because the caregivers and the family are really one of our greatest resources for learning how to support the students. And and so that would be one piece that we emphasize, you know, also when we're we're seeing students struggle is to make sure that we're, you know, engaging with the student. Have we developed, you know, that basis of trust with that student, you know? what is happening in those moments where uh, they may not feel safe or there's some need that is not basic need that's probably not being met and you know and what can we do in those instances um, we also utilize uh, you know a lot of restorative practices in in our program so that we can use those moments um, as teachable moments and make sure that we're able to like restore and repair and whatever has happened make sure that that student can come back into the community and, and be welcomed in that community. Um, we use a lot of uh, peace corners and really teach actually how to use those corners um, yeah. and, and make sure that we also don't frame it only as a place that you go if you're you know escalated for a negative reason. Like yeah. it's a place yeah. where even if you just need to take a break, um, or you're having a big emotion of any kind, it could be a positive emotion, but you know, you just need to step away and regulate um, that we normalize that everyone has big emotions. We're going to experience big emotions in this space. And, you know, we all have to learn how, you know, the strategies for, for managing that when we encounter it. Um, so that's another piece. I love that. And I think for folks that aren't familiar, right, having a Peace Corner is really having a, a calm space, a tentry set aside in the classroom where students understand that they can go there. Maybe they set a timer, depending on the age of the student. Maybe there's stuffed animals or fidgets or something to draw or color or just an opportunity to take some deep breaths and kind of reset and, and manage some of those big emotions. And it really is kind of a, a shame-free approach to managing those big feelings during the school day. And it's a space that is available for all students to use, right? And it also helps kind of the whole class understand how to have empathy for each other while also building those self-regulation skills and those skills that help them to manage those big emotions. As educators, we have to be thinking about our structure and routines. We have to be thinking about opportunities to help a student have a sense of control over their day, maybe even use a visual schedule or help them with translation, think about peer supports, and also ways to connect with families. And all of that's a lot. And so I really hear also that that as educators, we we have to maybe have some grace for ourselves in this work and to also look maybe for ways that as educators, we're not alone in this work, to rely on our colleagues and hopefully really a team effort as a school to best support all students, 
but especially students who are refugees or have experienced forced migration. Um, I'm curious, Sarah, just to pivot a little bit, what brought you into this work? Kind of, you know, personally, what brought you to the work you do with the International Rescue Committee? I always wanted to work on youth issues. You know, from the time I was a teenager, I was really passionate about the power and potential of youth and, you know, felt that societies could be stronger if we listened more and supported youth more. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm in rural Maine in a you know, pretty isolated community, which was wonderful in many ways, but I always had this deep desire to engage with the rest of the world and um, you know, on international issues. And in college, I took a class on humanitarian affairs and really got hooked. And so I made a lot of expensive mistakes, which, you know, sometimes can be fortuitous to um, one of those was thinking I could live on an AmeriCorps salary after college. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but this was my my entry point. I fell into uh, working with youth in Baltimore County in Maryland who had been expelled from middle school. And then from there, I went to an amazing place that was called the Malcolm X Youth Center in Baltimore City, um, where I progressed like, to working with youth who are a bit further down the path of alienation from mm -hmm. school and longer term impacts of adverse childhood experiences, you know, especially from drugs and poverty and community violence. I mean, we had three students who were shot and killed the year, the one year that I worked there. Um, which really gave me a much deeper understanding of the daily traumas that a person can get normalized to and how deeply that can affect a person and especially uh, young people. And, but I also felt like I had to find a way to merge my passions for this work with youth with international affairs. So I decided I had to go to graduate school. Upon graduating, I was able to get a job in IRC's New York City office uh, doing youth and education work uh, in the Liberian community on Staten Island. Uh, and, and that's where I felt like I found my home, this nexus of the global and the local and the youth. Wow. Now, I think a lot of educators can relate to working in a field where it aligns with the difference that you want to make in the world, your sense of purpose. It can be fulfilling in a lot of ways, but you also touched on you know, it can also expose you to trauma and secondary trauma. And I'm curious, you know, how have you kind of cared for your well-being so that you can stay in this work? Because I imagine sometimes it's got to weigh heavy on your heart. One of the most important things that I did, which I am not, I'm not prone to, you know, sharing a lot about, you know, my troubles, um, but I did, I talked to my boss about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so making sure I shared what I was feeling, it was really important one to kind of like sitting with that, those emotions and navigating through them. Um, the other thing is that I rely very heavily on dance as my outlet. Um, I feel like I need a physical outlet. I dance as my other passion and interest and I keep that alive. And I notice that when I let that slip at all, that, um, that I need to bring it back. Also, you know, mindfulness and breathing exercises. So Sarah, you've kind of mentioned, you know, the importance of linguistic supports for students. Would you say a little bit more about that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I would really encourage educators to think about linguistic supports and how they can increase students' sense of control, their sense of belonging, a sense of self-worth, their positive relationships, and their intellectual stimulation. Because I think too often the trauma-informed conversation is separate from supporting language acquisition and the English learner conversation. Mm. But for students who have experienced forced migration, they're displaced from their countries and coming to the U.S., these conversations really have to merge. You know, you think about the mental energy that your students are expending just to figure out how to navigate the environment or just to feel safe. Um, you know, linguistic supports can can lower that amount of mental energy, and they can also really enhance everything else that you're trying to do. Um, and this is one of the places where you can get creative and it can be really fun. So we run summer programs in many of our offices um, that are intensive. They expose students to um, you know, 
American school culture, teaching styles, and give them time to develop their English and their confidence, especially. And I oversaw uh, the New York City program for many years. It essentially, it's like pop-up school. <laughs> it's in a New York City Department of Education building. We hire DOE teachers. Um, and linguistic supports and these healing learning space principles are 100% embedded uh, in the program. So each year we you know, choose a theme and that theme really grounds uh, everything in the academy. Um, and I'll give the example of 2019 of the program that year was pride, positivity, responsibility, innovation, determination, and empathy. And so this was permeated, this theme permeated everything. We had matrices of expectations in the classrooms, the cafeteria, the auditorium, the hallways, you know, everywhere. Um, staff were trained and supported to use the same concise and consistent language to explain um, the values and how you demonstrate those, as the matrices said, in these different um, you know, areas of, of the building. We had an, a social emotional learning class that addressed them, incentives and recognition around it. And then we had the chant. The mm. chant is like my favorite part of, of the program every year. And it was usually developed by um, the arts partner that we worked with, which is an organization uh, based in New York now called Arts Ignite. Um, but in 2019, they decided to have the have alumni of the program who uh, were going to be staff members uh, of the program. And they wrote the chant for that year. And I don't know if you remember the mega hit from... Uh, 2019 Old Town Road by mm -hmm. oh, Little Nas yeah. X. <laughs> if you worked with you know youth, I'm sure you heard that. Like, oh yeah, Little Nas X is amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this they they created the chant um, to that tune, and the staff taught the chant, led it enthusiastically every Wednesday at our community events. It's booming in the auditorium after every field trip, after every opportunity. They're singing this chant, and it's got dance moves associated with it. I mean, I can sing it for you if, if you want. <laughs> Go for you, it you if you want. My yeah. sing. So it went, I'm going to take myself to the rice's door. I'm going to cry till I can't no more. I got a smile on my face. Positivity. Pencils in my bag. Responsibility. Ideas in my head. Innovation. Try my best. Determination. I care about you, empathy. Rise of Pride 2019. Oh, I, I care it. about you, empathy. Rise of Pride 2019. So, you know, <laughs> this was the icing on the cake. This could it be had, a collaboration, yeah. Yeah, it had yeah. everything. Predictability, consistency, positively framed values and expectations. Everyone was included. It had the total physical recall with the dance moves, which mm -hmm. I did not do adequately. It was relevant, you know, and at the ed end of six weeks, every student from age four to 21 knew and understood those values. Mm -hmm. um, and the data showed it, you know, the program in a program where 100 percent of the students have had adverse childhood experiences. Most students were successful with tier one. We had, you know, small numbers of two students needing those extra level layers of intensive supports. And it just really showed the power of like when you're intentional about addressing those five principles um, and embedding the linguistic supports, like how successful that can be. I love that story. It's such a beautiful example and it integrates so many important trauma-informed practices and the linguistic supports and creating that sense of belonging and also fun and joy, which is so important and so healing. And just out of curiosity, you know, is there a book or a resource you'd recommend for educators so that they could learn more about what it is to experience forced migration if they if that, you know, hasn't been something they've encountered in their own life personally or professionally? Yeah, there are there are many books out there. I mean, uh, but one that I've read uh, relatively recently um, is called Somewhere in the Unknown World, a collective refugee memoir. It's the author's name is Kao Kalia Yang, and I hope I'm saying her name correctly, but I apologize to her if I didn't. Um, she's a Hmong American writer, a former refugee herself, and she uh, collected stories from 
uh, other refugees from a variety of backgrounds and experiences and ages. And to me, I sent this book to all my friends a couple of holidays ago because it was just, um, it was intimate, mundane in the best way you can imagine that word being used um, mm -hmm. and just real. Um, and, and for that, I found it really, really powerful. And it just, it, it's not one experience, it's many experiences. And so that, for that, I think it's really incredibly valuable. So my final question, Sarah, you know, in, in doing this work now for years, what is one way that you feel that this work has changed you? I mean, I think I have certainly expanded my understanding of our education system and the inequities that are built into it, but at the same time, also, you know, that understanding of all that we can and should do uh, to, to break those inequities down. Um, but more personally, I think uh, it, it's really increased my, my self-awareness, you know, uh, try understanding more and more about trauma-informed care and trauma-informed education and the intersectionality of so many issues and how they affect individuals, I think has helped me to understand a lot about, you know, things that have happened in my own life or things that have happened to my loved ones. Um, and I, hopefully that has made me more empathetic and also, you know, a better partner and mom and daughter. I hope that's what my family would say. Fantastic. And thank you, Sarah, so much for the joining us for this conversation and for the work that you and your colleagues do at the International Rescue Committee. I got so much out of this and I appreciate you and all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. The Trauma and Resilience series is made possible by a partnership between the National Education Association and WETA. For more information, please visit adlit.org slash trauma. Trauma and Resilience is available on YouTube and on every major podcast platform. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to the whole series so you won't miss an episode.